Brilliant. So we're going to get started this week's live question and answer. So welcome back everybody to our weekly live question and answer. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Gemma Hillier Moses. I am the founder of Move Charity and the co-founder of our 5K UA initiative with the awesome Lucy Gossard. So to, I probably said that wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so today um, I have Georgie Freeman. <laughs> Hi, my surname's easier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. As my co-host. So Georgie is our 5K UA operational lead. Georgie joined us in March. Oh, brilliant. Great. Uh, <laughs> no, we love that. It's fine. <laughs> Bring them get, in. <laughs> yeah, we go with the flow on here. So um, Georgie is our 5K UA operational lead, is very passionate about physical activity and life adventures as well. We've been having a good chat about that today. Yeah, um, exactly. Thanks for having me. No worries. Um, I've so not got my t-shirt, sorry, because I'm at my, I've come to visit my, my mum and dad, so I forgot it. <laughs> That's my excuse. <laughs> we'll let you off. Um, so today we talk to the team behind some of the incredible work that is going on in Greater Manchester. So I would like to introduce our special guest, Hayley Lever has been the leading has been leading Greater Manchester moving since 2017, and this year um, she has combined this with a dual role as CEO role at Greater, at Greater Sports. <laughs> this is quite hard to get Hayley, so I hope I'm getting this right. For 25 years, she has played a leadership role in physical activity, sport policy, and community development and remains a committed community volunteer where she lives. Have I got that right, Hayley? Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. A... Nice to be here. Yeah, thank you so much for coming on as well. We know that you've been extremely busy, so thank you for giving up your time um, to join us today. And we have Matt Everson, who is a leading UK chest physician, lung cancer, plural tobacco dependency specialist in Greater Manchester Cancer Alliance, and Cure Project Lead, which we'll find out more about later. But also Matt is a, phys a fitness and physical activity champion and has um, his own personal experience with his son um, and cancer and also being part of our Wilmslow 5k away group. So hi Matt and thank you for joining us here today. No, thanks so much for having me. No worries. <laughs> um, so what we want to do is, um, so we've had a few people saying hello already. So you are more than welcome to ask any questions um, to Matt and Haley as we go through the question and answer. We may um, um, look and read them during the question and answer, but we will make sure your questions are asked at the end. Um, so basically, we wanted to start off because we thought it's really nice for anybody watching to actually get to know um, our guests and people to come up, that come on personally as well as also professionally and what you do. Um, so how have you guys, you, I see a lot of you guys um, putting things on Twitter and social media, which I think is brilliant when leaders in this sector actually um, show what they're doing personally in terms of physical activity and exercise. Um, so how have you guys been coping with lockdown over the last three months um, and being able to keep active as well? So hey, I'll start with Hayley actually to start off with. Okay, yeah, thanks. So um, yeah, for me, um, we, I've been working from home since the middle of March, uh, yeah, since the 16th of March, and it's been really different, actually. Um, so normally I would run, I would cycle, I would walk a lot, I walked to the train, I'd walk around Manchester to various different meetings and things. Um, I would swim, open water swim, and so I get think in the early part of lockdown, uh, I found the, um, and I'm really lucky to have been able to go out for an hour a day, but for me that felt really limiting actually, because I'm just used to being, being active in and throughout the whole day in various yeah. different ways. So, um, but however, you know, I'm really conscious that a lot of people and people in this community who would, will have not been going out at all. And I was always really conscious of that and how grateful I am for living where I live, because I live just out in the Peak District. So. It was really easy to get out for a walk and get away from, you know, there's nobody. I can go on the hill and I don't see anybody. So I'm um, really, really fortunate from that perspective. Um, but I sadly lost my father-in-law really early on in lockdown. And I actually really struggled to find the energy. I was in a new job, as you just said, I took on a new job in February. So that combination of new job, uh, you know, close family bereavement, lockdown, everything on top of each other, three teenage children at home, actually really appreciating being able to go out for an hour a day but but not having any energy to run like I didn't you know I, it was just a, for me it was more about going for a walk getting some headspace stress relief um breathe you know yeah. um and just rebalance so I think I, I absolutely have stayed active and used the opportunity to to remain active but for very different reasons and with a very different kind of you know way of fitting it into life yeah and I think Hayley so 
for somebody who is a leader in in the sector around physical activity and health how how important is it you to you to lead by example in terms of integrating physical activity and exercise into your life um selfish i think it, it probably is but actually it's more of a selfish drive than that it's absolutely the way that i stay sane and stay healthy and well so it's it's happy coincidence that i really feel the need to be active every day and particularly for me to be outdoors um is really really important to me um so so it's not difficult to be a role model in that respect because i i, I know and i've i've lived you know sort of my whole adult life with a deep understanding and appreciation for how being active is good for me um so i think one of the challenges uh where one of the things i've been thinking quite a lot about is in lockdown god you know all the people what about all the people who don't understand just how good this makes you feel and how, what a brilliant stress relief this is and you know that's a real shame because you know the lockdown has been incredibly stressful for everybody in lots and lots of different ways and the fact that I know I can go out for a walk and within 10 minutes kind of the stress levels have dropped um is just something I'm really really grateful to have that not like muscle memory for if you like yeah, yeah. Can I can I ask? Have you always been quite um, active, or did, did you said in your adult life were you active like before you started this kind of career within the active lifestyle community? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. So I think I, as a kid, I was always doing something. What I've done has changed very much over the years. So when I was you know younger and when I was a teenager, it was much more competitive sport, um, and and it was really social. It was whatever my friends were doing. So I remember turning up to things I remember first of all being invited to go and play basketball and I went because all of my friends were going I didn't actually know what it was <laughs> <laughs> I, I pictured the sport with a big bat in your hand um, and then I turned up and they were playing basketball so for me it was always about the social thing and it was what my friends were doing and I just loved being active and loved doing things I didn't kind of sit still and then I suppose in my 20s I became much more into um, you know running marathons and ultra marathons and all that kind of thing and then as I've got older it's just changed but I just know I suppose no matter what it is I'm doing um, I still play some sport now I still play in the local netball league um, so I do lots of different things but it's a social thing and it's headspace and it's staying well and healthy and sleeping well and all of that these days I think when you get to middle age your drivers are very different. <laughs> <laughs> That's like me actually I count the amount of hours I'm gonna have to sleep in the night to make sure I get eight hours and I don't set my <laughs> alarm unless I have those eight hours because I can't function without it. I don't think I ever did that in my 20s. <laughs> so yeah it does change doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Brilliant. So Matt, how about you? How have you been keeping, how's lockdown affected you guys and your family and how have you been keeping active if you've managed to? It's a slightly different viewpoint of lockdown for me in that um, one of the uh, benefits of working in the NHS is that you retain the structure of a working day. Um, and uh, and, that, and that's been a full-time role. Uh, and so even before lockdown, um, physical activity for me was always a morning activity before work, um, which meant that then later in the day and after work would be a family time. Um, I've got three children. Um, and so that structure was relatively easy to replicate in lockdown because I was carrying on working. Yeah. Uh, and that structure, I think, was even more important during lockdown because of the challenges we were facing in the uh, in the NHS and, that, and the exercise, um, it acts as that decompression um, and the ability to cope and to, and to keep going through it. So although um, uh, there were changes in how we could exercise, um, so gyms shutting, you know, uh, big fan of strength training, uh, and so gym shutting down was a big thing. But the, the gym I go to, um, uh, was really good and just before lockdown they allowed uh, people to go in and, and pick up a few bits of kits to take home and yeah. give us programs that we could do at home right. so you know I have a few bits of kit at home and and a structure to to do sessions with those bits of kit and I could still do that early in the morning as I would do before and then go off to work um, equally I work at, uh, at Withenshaw Hospital. It's not all that far from my, from my home, maybe six or seven miles. So it's quite easy to 
get the bike out, cycle to work or run to work and bring activity into that normal part of the day. Um, and by doing that, you then still leave the evening times for uh, getting home, family time. And actually the, uh, for, um, for my wife and for the children, their structure really had changed in lockdown without school and losing that bit of structure. Um, so it would very much become a time where to get home from work, we could then go out with the children um, and, um, and do whatever exercise that was on a bike ride or a walk or um, uh, whatever we do. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's working all the way through has, has given me quite a lot of normality at a time when many, many people um, uh, haven't had that normality. And so I was still able to structure things in the same times that I would have done normally. And again, it's another piece of, of normality. Um, yeah. So really interesting to hear Haley talk about that change and how it affects um, the, um, just the appetite and the, not, the, losing that structure and the ability to exercise as you would do normally. And it's really yeah. interesting... Oh, sorry, Hayley, you can... I, was just, I was just thinking that, that you'd, uh, I was just one of the things that I found really difficult is I'm a real rule abider. So the fact that you would have been allowed to go because it was essential for you to get to work. So then yeah. you can do two things. And that, yeah. that was just like, you know, uh... I, you know, I didn't even feel like I could go and do something unless it was absolutely on the way home from an essential journey. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's difficult, isn't it? Because part of it was using common sense, but also part of it was actually our, the rules and things that were put on us made, yeah, made you feel a bit more stressful about the decisions that you've had to make. And I think definitely even in the transition between full lockdown and then things getting a little bit back to normal, there is quite a, you know, a bit of anxiety around what should I do? What shouldn't I do? Other people are doing this. Should I do that? And yeah. especially for those who've been shielding in this community, actually, they, you know, there's a lot of difficult decisions to, to make when life starts to go, to go back to normal. And, um, and I, I was just thinking there, Matt, when you mentioned about, um, you know, your, the exercise and physical activity being a form of control during this current time. And, and I, I hearing there's two things actually I'm hearing um, quite often at the minute that actually that's why a lot of people have been exercising because while everything else was outside of their control, they could have control of that. But also the word the new normal. Now I've only really ever heard those two things uh, talked about mostly with people living with and beyond cancer. So a new normal I've never ever heard in any other circumstance other than when you've had cancer and you talk about your new normal. So it's actually amazing to hear people in the general public because of COVID-19 start to talk about a new normal and actually not necessarily have the experience of somebody that's been through cancer but have a certain element of your life being taken outside of your control and then what that life then looks like moving forward and I think we all know the power of exercise and physical activity what that can affect on your life regardless of your circumstance um, and I think we're really seeing the power of it now um, in this in this way. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a really important uh, um, uh, similarity to uh, the, the conversations we're having with patients during COVID and the conversation we have. Can be now. And it's so, so common to hear someone say um, that they've lost control of everything. And a cancer diagnosis can come so quickly and such a bolt out of the blue that that loss of control is uh, amplified. Um, and, and alongside that, though, um, you know, I, we're, I often have talks about different treatment options um, in, in lung cancer. And, um, and a lot of those conversations center on that we can't control the outcome of those treatments. That is out of our control. But the things that we can control is the preparation for treatment, the recovery from the treatment. And actually exercise is one of those things that comes in under our control in this, in a, in a whole web of, of things that have been, uh, where that, that control has been lost. There are things we can grab onto and, and, and feel like we're gaining control again. It's a really common report. And actually one way we, uh, I see that, com that there, are some, there are positivity that comes out of really distressing conversations that these are the positives, these are the things we can control. Um, uh, and there are real, you're quite right, there's real similarities now for, for, what, for how coronavirus has impacted people. 
yeah. um, in the same way that can, uh, in a similar way that cancer impacts on people. Yeah. So let's talk about both of your roles professionally and what what is it exactly? I know I did it said in the introduction, but I won't have done it justice for how complex your both your roles are professionally. So I just wanted to ask you both, um, and I guess it'd be quite good to talk to Matt first around this, um, around lung cancer and the cure project that you're working on um, for people living with and beyond cancer. Where are you at with that now? So um, how successful has that project been, but also the impact it's having in Greater Manchester? I guess from a professional point of view, if you can explain, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm a lung specialist here at Withenshaw Hospital. And um, so um, a huge amount of my work is in lung cancer. Um, and there's lots of, um, of different projects that we have running in there. Um, so as a chest physician, one of my main roles is around diagnosing lung cancer and all the tests that are done to try and do so to diagnose that camera tests and biopsies and um, different types of sampling procedures in the lungs and imaging uh, procedures for the lungs. Um, one of the uh, one of our, our major projects as a hospital here has been around lung health checks. So the great uh, one of the real horrors of lung cancer is that um, it's it, in the early stages rarely has symptoms. So your your lungs have no nerves in them. So you can't feel anything in your lungs. You can't feel something growing there or something being there. And so one of the horrors can be that the, the symptoms can only develop when, um, uh, when the cancer starts to affect other places. And so late diagnosis in lung cancer is a huge, huge problem. And it's one of the reasons that it's uh, one of the biggest causes of cancer deaths. So we've been running a, a program to try and promote early diagnosis. Um, where we try and go out, go out into the community and offer lung health checks, particularly focusing on people that have, uh, have smoked before or, or still smoke, um, where they have a lung health check that looks at lo lots of parts of lung health, but one of them being their risk of lung cancer. And if their risk is high, they're offered a CT scan then and there. Um, and so wow. um, it's this CT scanner in supermarket car parks um, that's had a few stories wow. around it. And uh, um, and that's that we know that that works to identify lung cancer well before it would have caused symptoms when we're much more likely to be able to um, to offer curative treatments. So that's been one of our, our major projects and something that's running in um, in some areas of Manchester. And how long has that other... been going? Sorry, Matt, how long has that been going on for? Is that quite a new project? Is it? So we run a pilot oh. funded by Oh, I think we're, lo we're losing you a bit. Um, and that was, um, a, a, that just cuts out. Yeah, just yeah. a little bit. <laughs> You're back now <laughs> though, I think. Uh, so we ran a small pilot in 2016. It was funded by Macmillan, so they're great credits. Uh, and then the success of that pilot has led to uh, us running a, a, a programme across the north part of the city of Manchester um, and it's also been one of the reasons why NHS England have funded 10 pilot sites around the country to start doing this so uh -huh. it's been it's a project that's been going for many years before then in the making there was a pilot phase and now we're trying to um, uh, to escalate the service and there's a real will in Greater Manchester to try and make this a service across the region but the logistics of that are, are really significant and the resources needed but that's um, this is something we're working towards um, so that, I think it's, that's a really exciting part of lung cancer care that we hope can really make a difference in this late stage presentation to early stage curative treatment. Yeah that's brilliant. Um, the the cure project is is slightly different to that, and that in my one of my other roles is um, is around treating tobacco dependency. Um, and the cure project is about putting really high quality and comprehensive services into hospitals, because um, uh, because smoking makes people sick. There's a huge number of smoke that are in contact with hospital services every day and with um the, in the past i think there have been some real major errors about how the nhs and how 
healthcare professionals have approached and offered help to smokers. In the past, we've been guilty of um, considering it as a lifestyle choice and something that we advise uh, someone that they should stop. We're actually with, with uh, what's really important to understand the power of addiction to nicotine within tobacco and understand that that nicotine itself is a relatively harmless substance. It just causes an addiction in the brain. All the harm from smoking comes from the thousands and thousands of chemicals when you burn tobacco. Mm. And we have some really, really effective treatments for someone who is dependent on tobacco, really effective treatments. And healthcare professionals have never really been properly trained to understand those interventions and to see it as their responsibility to offer those treatments and uh, be very proactive in that, in that field. Um, so the Cure Project is about trying to address that, trying to empower clinicians, all types of clinicians, because wherever you work in a hospital, you will see smokers and you'll see the damage that smoking does. So everybody within a hospital can play their role on a daily basis. And if we can empower them to do that with the skills and the competence, um, we could have huge, huge benefits. And when you combine that, um, that medical intervention with um, uh, specialists who can help with behavioral change, because it's a really deep-seated in, embedded habit, smoking, yeah. and there are some really powerful behavioral change techniques. And when you combine those two things, medical management and specialists and behavioral change, you can get incredible results. And that, so that project has been about empowering clinicians, bringing them up to the level of competence so that they can engage and help treat anybody that they meet with dependency to, to tobacco and putting in teams um, that have the capacity to try and see every smoker that comes into hospital and offer them help. And so we've, we've been running this since 2018 and with Insure. Uh, hospital and we know from the uh, from that service that one in five smokers after being admitted to hospital have quit three months after being discharged wow wow yeah and if you think that a, there's a million smokers that are admitted to hospital over the course of the year if that translated nationally it'd be 200,000 people quitting um so we're trying to um uh, in the process of helping other hospitals implement this service and do the same thing we've done here um so it's a and that will, it's a massive passion for me. And there's, there's so many synergies with physical activity so mm -hmm. with, between tobacco and with physical activity. Because yeah. I think it's been an area where the NHS has not focused its resources on. And we're far too embroiled in the treatment phase of disease when there's so much we could be doing earlier on that actually pays off it far more significantly than when you're trying to manage a disease further down the line. Yeah. Um, and uh, both, I think both tobacco, both physical activity, there are areas where, where, where doctors and nurses, they don't really get training in them to have the skill set to be able to address it and confidently address it, which means it can get neglected. And yeah. so I, I see so much synergy in, in what we've done with Cure and then actually what needs to happen with hospitals in terms of physical activity. Because yeah. hospitals are, you know, patients are, are the victim of the hospital. You get into hospital, put in your pajamas, have your meals brought to you with a television next to you. Mm -hmm. And that, following the same lines that we've done with tobacco, we need to do the same thing with physical activity and completely change that environment and that ethos and that culture to one of, a, um, of active hospital sites. Yeah, and I think that's really powerful, Matt, as well, because... I think it's exactly what you said. I was going to ask actually from a, yeah, from the process and the protocols that you've been through in terms of the retraining of healthcare professionals, that absolutely also needs to happen around physical activity because we see it from 5K away and Tony will, Tony, the Wilms ambassador will say to you how many times we've been in to hospitals and you have healthcare professionals that, you know, will, will want to refer people to a 5K away group or, or talk to them about physical activity and exercise, but it's not an integrated approach across the cancer care pathway and yeah. I think they're the issues that happen because when you are sat in a consultant room I was diagnosed at the age of 24 in 2012 and it I they they give you that they are 
those rooms and those places that you sit with healthcare professionals are where teachable moments happen and they can be teachable either positive or they can also be negative by being withheld information that may actually yeah. affect your life in the long run and you know I was never discussed as well <laughs> at all and I, I would never have related it to cancer oh, cool. until I use my own experience um, and so I think there's so much we can learn from what's going on with the work that you're doing of actually does it, ha it like and this brings on to Haley as well actually that whole system approach like we're banging at the door at the minute in terms of cancer and physical activity we aren't there yet of yeah. being every single cancer patient has the opportunity to be told about how physical activity can have a positive impact on your life and what you know what changes you can make to be able to take that next step because it's not it's not easy like we said if you know if exercise was put in a pill every single person would be taking it but yeah. why do we know how good it is but why is it so hard to take that take that first step um so yeah <laughs> and yeah. so Hayley let's so, come on to you then yeah around this whole topic yeah so I mean so you can see why I love working with Matt because um yeah. what he's described there is um is is a kind of microcosm of what we're trying to do across Greater Manchester in, with regard to physical activity and um, but he's described it there what he, what he's described is a whole system approach to tobacco addiction um which is about everything from the from every contact that happens within a hospital setting you know to the to the types of behavioral support and etc uh, and and it is what we're trying to do with Greater Manchester Moving is, is um, grow, grow a movement which is around a whole system approach to addressing inactivity, getting people living active lives and, and, and engaging. And I suppose, why is, it, why is it so difficult? Well, because moving has been designed out of our lives. So we talked about it at the very beginning, didn't we? In lockdown, it was even more designed out of life. Um, for a long time in my career, we've tried to get people to participate in sport and physical activity in quite a formal structured way, you know, in kind of our mindset was much, was definitely around, um, is about participation. Well, it's not, not only about participation in sport and physical activity, it's about movement as part of everyday life. So the framing of, um, of what we're trying to do has really shifted in the last few years to be one of um, designing moving back into life, um, it being everybody's business. So everybody from someone working in a hospital to someone working in a school to parents to all sorts of leaders across the whole system. And, and the idea that we all influence, um, we, all inf we can all influence how much people move every day. Um, and that actually, if we designed moving back into life in terms of the ways that our places are built, the ways that our transport and infrastructure is designed, the way that our work and times and schedules around work um, operate, the way our schools operate, then actually you you get people hitting their kind of daily target of minutes of physical activity per day actually really quite easily without you know even then you can layer in participation and sport and physical activity for those that want to engage in more formalized approaches but but modern society has designed moving out of life so we're about trying to design it back in again um, and it is you know around it, I suppose what we're trying to do is create a culture change um, so that moving is normal again you know and, and that it is and yes there are lots of there are lots of barriers and challenges um in the extent to which any one of us can be active in any given day and some people have more challenges than other than others but there are an awful lot of forces pulling against us at the moment um just in terms of the way our, the, the way our life is is designed and structured and organized so so that's what we're trying to do. So the work that I'm leading across Greater Manchester is to engage, and, and it's probably best maybe to just start describing the way that it's um, governed even, is, is about, it's not just the physical activity sports sector or the leisure sector who govern Greater Manchester moving. Um, it's Transport for Greater Manchester, it's the Health and Social Care Partnership, it's the local authorities, it's the charities and voluntary sector, it's the Leisure Trust, it's Greater Sport, you know, it's a whole system it's Sport England so so even in the way that we're doing the work you know every single day is, is a much more um much more complex set of relationships than it ever has been and, and we're really lucky in Greater Manchester to have a devolved system where we have a real sense of clear and common sort of shared purpose for health and well-being in its broadest sense and for how people being how happy and healthy and well and contribute to the success of Greater Manchester, when that, whether that's economic success, whether that's, um, you know, in terms of a green city region where we've got clean air and no congestion. And so we're all kind of pulling in the same direction, which is, which is amazing. So I meet people like Matt, 
and and we we have a conversation in a coffee shop like we did when we first met and somebody said oh you need to meet this person he gets it he's he's part of the part of the club kind of thing and then you realize that actually what you're trying to do is is the same yeah. you yeah. might be doing it from a lung health perspective um, and a tobacco addiction perspective and I'm doing it from a physical activity perspective well that's what my drivers are and what I'm measured by but when those two things come together you get the sweet spot of how these things contribute to each other yeah Um, and then for anyone you know for an individual and people listening to this is you know you've got you've got then a system that's trying to create the conditions for, for you to live a healthy happy active life and, and, and moving away from the idea that it's that it's all down to your personal level of motivation and can you wake up in the morning and find the motivation to get up and move today um, because the way life is designed becomes more conducive to, to moving. Um, and, and if you're living with cancer or if you are getting ready for cancer treatment or if you're recovering from cancer treatment, um, then the, everything that wraps around you ought to be you know, helping you and supporting you in that direction. Yeah. rather than it being about you knowing it or you believing it or you haven't had a long history of life uh, an active life that you can draw on then um, that becomes the system um supporting you to do that better and that's so important Haley, because i think and i think a lot of people feel that it's we're at the complete opposite when you're diagnosed with cancer you are you're not really encouraged unless you find out the right information around moving a little bit more it's like the polar opposite in terms of stay in bed, don't move much. And it's getting, you know, it's getting better, but it still isn't, people have to really seek out that information or have a consultant that has positive experiences with exercise and physical activity that will talk to them about that. And I think that's what we're trying to do with 5K Away is actually with our 5K Away groups is bring healthcare professionals down to these groups with patients so they can be part of the bigger picture. So then it becomes, you know, from our small charity and our small movement that we're trying to do is actually to, integrate everything so that the conversation starts at cancer diagnosis or you know we don't necessarily know when the right time is yet but it's like if that's involved in the conversation more it becomes normal when you're diagnosed with cancer to talk about exercise whereas I still feel and I think a lot of people agree it's not the norm yet for that to be part of the conversation. Yeah and not and also you know I've experienced this myself with your know, family and friends who've been living with cancer is um you sort because of, it's, it shouldn't be your job either to persuade your family and friends that it's okay for you to yeah. to engage yeah. in physical activity. So, you know, because then that's just another burden of responsibility. And and I think the other the other aspect to all of this in this particular case with five k your way is, um, you know, the social side and the support and the and the people coming together um to not only to be active because obviously there's huge benefits in that, but the mental well being that comes out of connecting with other people in a sense of community. And the time you spend having a coffee afterwards and you know and getting that kind of support it's you, you know you can't underestimate the power of that um for what well, for any of us never yeah you know, let alone somebody who's living with cancer yeah absolutely yeah. and then i think like what, what you say like in terms of then you're around people who understand what you've been through and you share your own stories and then that impacts on the next person and the next person because those positive stories around moving more community social reducing social isolation all becomes the norm and the barriers start to break down then and I think yeah, yeah and like that's say, culture change that's yeah. that's culture change because you've got a whole different ideology that that we're all kind of a part of that's what Those I was when, stay when, there, take oh, care yeah when you're talking about moving you know bringing movement into into everyday life it's you're you're talking about a whole culture change really aren't you mm. um and I was I was wondering do you do you find that this has worked anywhere else have you copied it from any other from you know anywhere else in the UK or any other countries or or where did you get these ideas for a whole culture movement change so um there's bits of it in different places so you could point to Copenhagen or Amsterdam and you could look at how many people ride bikes to work and walk to work and all of that and so some places have got pockets of it um I don't think there's anywhere yet in the world that's kind of got the whole system approach with all of the kind of boxes ticked with all of the ingredients if you like and and also I think one of the one of the best challenges in this way of working is there isn't an evidence base behind it so we're creating the evidence base as we go um and even today we've had like our Ofsted equivalent and I've been asked all so the data active lives data which is what we work to you know work to try and shift um is heading in a great direction for Greater Manchester we're making real progress and then you get asked the question why you know what what is it that you're doing that is um you know that is helping to make progress and close gaps in inequalities and stuff 
And the answer to the question of why is it's it's all of the things, you know, it's it's a million different things that are going on on any given day in Greater Manchester. It's, you know, it's programmes, it's interventions, it's services, it's how the healthcare services work in, it's how the transport system's operating. So you can't, you have to get really comfortable with the fact that you won't be able to take credit for success and, and success won't belong to one thing or another. Yeah. But what you can get more sure of is the way, the approach and the way of working of designing moving back into life is is getting you ever closer to the goal um yeah. and you know and greater manchester you know leading the way um in, in the Sounds uk amazing. <laughs> it, and yeah. It, it, manchester. It, <laughs> yeah it absolutely is because it's the reason why we had the prehab the cancer team on the live question answer a few weeks ago and you know and you see it's the system with you guys on that it's the whole system and it's yeah. you are absolutely leading the way and and i think what's amazing is the passion and the energy when you're speaking to you guys it makes you yeah it, you can see it comes through and I think that's important it's not just the work that you do it's the people within the team that make that work happen because they have that deep-rooted passion to make change and I think that's so super important um so what I want to come on to now Matt I want to have a chat with you so just obviously we've chatted from a professional side of things but also a personal story around your son Jacob so I won't do the honours well enough, but I know that um, Jacob has been part of the Wilmslow 5K Away group, which is amazing. And for those of you who haven't seen the video of Jacob's first um, group, um, yeah, group meeting, um, yeah, kind of explain Jacob's story and how he got involved in 5K Away. Um, yeah, so I have three boys. Uh, so Jacob's my, um, my middle son. Uh, and when he was four months old, he was diagnosed with leukaemia. Um, and he then went through um, two rounds of treatment with chemotherapy, wasn't working, um, and so he needed to have a bone marrow transplant. Um, and we, and thankfully, my eldest son was a, a match, 100% uh, match, and he was the bone marrow donor. Um, so he then uh, spent, in total, probably about six months in the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital, through, and, the, and the vast majority of that was in the hospital with very the occasional uh, few days out of hospital. There's about six months in hospital having treatment, chemotherapy, then the bone marrow transplant and then the, the subsequent recovery period afterwards. And it was a recovery period really after, uh, after the, that bone marrow transplant, it was really poorly. And, you know, they, it's, um, it's a fairly traumatic thing to go through um uh oh, you know watching your son go through that the strength yeah. of chemotherapy you have to have to to go through a bone marrow transplant you know thankfully he was, was a baby and, and really carries very few memories of it of it now um and so that for that for that six months um we were myself and my wife were um kind of alternating between the hospitals. So one day, one of us was with Jacob in the hospital and the other one was at home with Ethan. Uh, the next day we would switch over. Um, and, you re and, and we were in that we live quite close to that hospital. We met many, many families there that, um, that travelled from Northern Ireland from all around the country, and they were in this bubble of the hospital where families can stay so they're, they're next to their children. But you are, you're in this bubble of, of hospital food, um, of inactivity, of immense stress and trauma. Um, and, you know, for me, that one of the ways I coped with that time was running to and from the hospital um for when we were doing the switchover um because it gave you moments to um just decompress and just soak in what had happened in the last 24 hours and be then ready to um do whatever you were you were going to do so when we were going home you had to then be ready to to look after a three-year-old yeah. and and um and do that and try and provide some normality you're going into the hospital and you're going into a really difficult situation. So it, became, it was a really important part of it and a coping mechanism. And one now looking back, I'm acutely aware that many other people didn't have that, that option. And, and again, it's another real, for me, a really personal reason about the drive for active hospital sites. Um, and that's within our hospital trust where I work, the, the Children's Hospital and the Ronald McDonald House. 
So how can families get access to do some activity at times like that to, to, to help with that, that truly awful time? Um, and, you know, thankfully, they're an amazing team at the Children's Hospital and he's done brilliantly. Um, so in October this year will be five years after his, after his transplant. Wow. Um, and uh, he's a spirited uh, young chap. Um, and it, it's, it's really important for me um, and for my wife that, that the, the importance of physical activity translates to our children. And we're, you know, you talked about that leading from the front and leadership roles professionally, but also personally as parents, we want to be leaders and role models for our children. Jacob had a quite an unusual form of leukemia. It was an isolated kind of a tumor in, in one of his bones, not spread through his bone marrow. It was really quite localized in his arm. Um, and it was at the top of his arm, just where the growing plate is in the bone. Uh, and as part of his treatment, he had some radiotherapy and it's really affected the growth of his arm and then the movement of his shoulder. And that will be quite restricted. So exercise is going to, the normal things for him are going to be more challenging, like riding a bike. Um, the first time he got on a scooter, because his arm's shorter, it just veers off to the side. Oh. You know, and you don't know whether to laugh or cry. Oh, um, <laughs> but all those things that kids enjoy and, and, and cycling are going to be that more challenging yeah. it's really important we show that challenge is not something to be feared it's something to, to embrace and that makes you better um, and so when, you, when it was Tony that reached out to me and just, just like Haley, you know said very kindly said we, you, you sometimes meet people and you just get a sense that you want to go on whatever journey they're going on, that you want to be part of it. And Tony's just like that. Yeah. Uh, and so he, he contacted me and, and, and really he was the one that told me about 5K your way. We met, we talked about it. Superb. Because it gives me as a professional a really tangible thing to say to someone, uh, you know, this is an event, this is a... This is a um, um, it's a movement, isn't it? It's get together with other people going through hard times, but are reaping huge benefits from it. Um, so professionally, that was great. It gives me something to talk to patients about. Um, and we've got the 5K You Always signs up in our waiting rooms and our clinic rooms. Amazing. And then per but personally, it's equally, um, I thought it'd just be a great thing for me and Jacob to go and do. Um, and because that's the whole, you know, the, the brilliance of 5K your way is you do it your way and you go and walk 10 steps and then cheer everybody else on and go for a coffee, run it at, the, at a fast pace, walk it one lap to whatever, it, whatever it is, you do it your way. And so my way would be walk it with Jacob and it's, an, it's a good way of introducing exercise. And so for the first few, he went on my back and we, and we walked around um, and so, and it was a nice way to walk with some of the other 5K Your Way um, members and, uh, and people we met. And just not that often where me and him got, you know, 45 minutes to just play I Spy. Um, oh. And it's not easy in a park when all you've got is trees and grass. <laughs> and runners. <laughs> <laughs> and, but so it was... Um, so yeah, professionally, fantastic thing. And personally, uh, meant a lot that me and him could go and do something. And it's, and it's evolved and my other children have come down and we go for coffee afterwards. Jacob's really fond uh, of, of the people he's met down there. Um, and, and Tony's um, uh, co-ambassador, Sarah, always has cakes ready at 5K your <laughs> way. Um, so she is top of Jacob's list. Um, <laughs> Brilliant. So yeah, it's just a you know, fantastic thing. And I think, I think anybody who is listening to this, they need to head over to your Twitter and scroll through. Maybe we can reshare it again of this yeah. video that you, um, you posted um, after the first time where Jacob was on your back. And it was just yeah. really heartwarming and amazing. And I actually looked at one of your tweets recently and you described the 5K Away group meetup as a chance for you and Jacob to spend time together playing silly games time to yeah. reflect on his illness his recovery and the importance of physical activity for him as he grows up and I think like just listening to your talk Jacob is very um lucky to have you as his dad because on your all your kids are because I think to to reflect and to also show the importance of a challenge how like life is challenging but it's also nothing to shy away from and how important physical activity is like it's so good that you can lead and show him the way with that as well 
and you're the kids so yeah very lucky to have you as a dad Matt <laughs> but thank you for sharing that personal story because I think you know we're talking about how old Jacob now is he oh so he's five now yeah so we're talking about a five-year-old um kid getting experience through the 5k away group meetup so it's like it's actually from young kids all the way up to any age 80 90 year olds who come to the group and it mixes in that community so well doesn't yeah. it um, and I think there is the it's the shared experience as well because it can be quite a nervous thing to go to be a new person to go into a group um, and at, you know at Park Run it is there's often big crowds and there's some um, and some people are there really there for the activity side of things and even competitive side of things so that can almost be intimidating I think if someone is is early on in their uh, activity journey. Um, but also it's quite intimidating to go and meet people you haven't before and put experience, I think, automatic, automatically unites people and, and makes that feel like a very natural process and, and certainly did. Um, and much, again, to Tony and Sarah's credit, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, the it's great going out and doing the walk i love doing that and then afterwards we go and sit down and have a coffee and it's not right go around in the group and tell your story and yeah. there's that unwritten everybody knows that there is a there's a shared experience and and that helps you feel united yeah yeah and i think like you say it's a community within an existing community and within an existing incredible community that is part run yeah like you say with that sense of understanding without you can talk about it if you want to but actually you can just come down yeah. and move in your in your own way so i think we we i told you we wouldn't stick to 40 minutes <laughs> <laughs> i could chat to you both for hours actually but i think i want it we're not you know 5k away isn't about competition or anything it's about coming around doing 5k away However, we've had the but. question from Tony. <laughs> we have to ask. ask Matt and Hayley, what is your, or what do you think would be your fastest time? If, or what is your fastest time around Wilmslow Park Run? We'd love to hear. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my fastest time is about 45 minutes. Oh, yeah. have you done, have you done <laughs> with it? Three year old yet? on my back. <laughs> I haven't um, run it. I've always walked it with, a, with any number of children. <laughs> Wow, now there's not park run. You need to get get on it. <laughs> I think we must I think we've got to have a challenge. And I think Tony's basically already challenged you, Matt. We want to see yeah. how fast that you can do the Wilmsley Park Run, whether that's when it's back on or the not the not park run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hayley, how about you? Have you um have you run Wilmsley Park Run? I didn't actually. I went across, I think it was the second 5k your way, or yeah. maybe the third time it would been on. Um and I went across and, and met up with everybody there. Um, and, I, and I have to say, I, I, as like I said before, I live in the Peak District, so I go up the hill. So it was too flat for me. <laughs> <laughs> I find it, the great thing about people think, oh, fell running, it must be really hard. Actually, it's not because you just walk as soon as it gets past a certain gradient. So, um, but as I said before, I think I've been walking more than running during during lockdown. But I think, um, yeah, going to do a, a kind of flat park run was a real challenge for me. I can't remember, I can't remember what time I did it in. Um, but it's the first time I've kind of run 5k at any, at any space for ages um, so I will not be getting into a competition with Matt anyway um, definitely <laughs> not any day I think, I think, uh, I think, I think it... this was really sorry as I was gonna say something really important in that for me which is because like Matt said um, part run can feel intimidating to some people as much as it you know the whole movement tries to create the atmosphere of it being for everyone it doesn't yeah. matter if you walk or run or whatever I still hear you know I've got to be really honest I do still hear from people um, a sense of park run the people at the front who are there with their watches ready and ready to go and all of that and, and park run have done amazing work over the last few years to start to really think about how they can contribute to health and well-being and make it as inclusive as possible and I think the um, the 5k your way is a it's not just a model for how how it could be supportive for people living with cancer. It's a model for how you know Park Run can, can continue to be more accessible and inclusive to people who you know who just want to be part of a community and turn up and do something. Um, and it, I just think there's so much learning coming out of this that's more widely relevant. Yeah, and that's also great to hear from your perspective as the, you know, leading and connecting the charities and the different organisations in the sector together, actually, where that, why that is important in that space uh, and how it can be integrated into outside of just cancer as well and how that, and how that works. 
absolutely because a lot of what you've talked about um, in this in this session around culture change you could say the same thing for people who are who are pregnant you could say say the same people for so many so many life situations people are in if we could change a culture so like there aren't any contraindications to becoming more active for the vast majority of people you know being active is always going to be a, a good thing uh, there's obviously a absolutely massive spectrum as to what that can mean um, but even for someone who's at home shielding self-isolating um, some sort of everyday movement in, in the home is really what we should be thinking about at, the, at this point because some people still really can't can't get out you know and, and do anything outside of the home so we've got to be really mindful of the massive spectrum of what's what's right for people um, but if the culture was you know commonly accepted that moving more is a good thing for 99.9 .9 percent of the population you know then we're onto a good we're on a good track yeah absolutely and i love what you said about designing movement back into life so i've actually yeah. never heard it like that before and actually we've become a culture of you know movement isn't designed into our lives and that's what this shift needs to start to happen and i think we did see a shift in terms of in the last three months and now it's continuing that shift um in the long run isn't it outside of the current situation when times do get more difficult as well yeah um, hopefully so. it'll be one of the positives of lockdown will be that people actually started exercising during and hopefully will actually continue one of the positives of the of a global pandemic <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly so i think we'll try and i think we've With got one question one question here. Um, yeah, I don't mind. Joy, did you want to just, I think you might. Yeah, so it. it's from SAS Hockey. Um, she says, the UK appears to be behind other countries in cancer prehab and rehab. What can we do to change this to integrate it into cancer care? Tough question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think we've kind of touched on that. Um, but did you want to elaborate any more, Matt? Um, it's a great question. Um, and... And it's a really relevant question, and um, and I think and I hope every healthcare professional that's involved in cancer care has the ambition to see um, us get to the point in the UK where we have comprehensive prehab and rehab services for for all uh, cancer patients, and really across the healthcare system. Um, the uh, Gemma was saying you've had the prehab for cancer. Um, team on here uh, from Greater Manchester who yeah. have done an incredible job of embedding um, prehab uh, into the system and one of the successes of that seems to be that it's where the healthcare community and the leisure centre and the leisure community have, have collaborated incredibly well because on the one side there's the healthcare um, professionals that see the value of this and understand it's a must, but feel relatively powerless in how do you implement and actually logistically provide the structure in which anyone from around a region can access that kind of service. And um, and the and you know one of the um, the great things about Greater Manchester and, the, and the, the leisure facilities that have joined together in Greater Manchester, it meant that those two things can, can marry up where the healthcare professionals and the, and the leisure service can, um, can get together and utilise each other's um, access to patients on one side and then access to the infrastructure to deliver this really system-wide approach. And I, I really think that's why the, why the success of that has come. Yeah. But... Yeah it's still early in its journey. Um, it's been funded through uh, pilot money or transformation money. And we've got a responsibility to make that sustainable, prove its worth uh, and make it sustainable. So I think the model is right. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and it, I know it's achieving great things. The, the patient feedback we have of our own patients that go into that service is incredible. Um, and as I said earlier in the, in the session was about that taking back control at a time when it feels like you're losing all control. That's a really strong message that comes out of that, uh, out of that program. And it is making people fitter, which means the treatment will go better. Um, so it's an ambition. Absolutely. I think everybody has that ambition. And I think uh, that there's some really great work going on in Greater Manchester that is um, starting to show the way forward and it's been very much that whole system approach that Haley's described yeah. we can't do it on our own as healthcare professionals far from it it's one small piece of the of the jigsaw 
Um, and I'm sure Hayley will, will can elaborate on that as well. Yeah, no, I was just going to, uh, what I would say is um, that we do have that opportunity because of the very nature of the fact that you've got GM Active, you know, the leisure providers working hand in hand with the health and care system to, to do that. And it, and again, it's another microcosm of, of, of the challenge we've got, which is, you, you know, you pilot and you test something that, that's, that works. And then the big question for us is how do you systematize that? How do you just make that the norm, you know, rather than it being a short term funded program? How do you get the culture change that makes it more normal around the, the conversation that goes on around people moving when they're living with cancer? You almost need everything from a spectrum from the change in narrative and language and approach and mindsets through you know for for some people that'll be all that it takes for other people they will absolutely need a dedicated program um really hand you know support handhold um and there's kind of everything in between i think the prehab the prehab cancer work demonstrates that really clearly isn't it is that you know some people really need that dedicated um you know focus support at that time so so it's how do you take it from being a transformation program and a pilot to something that is just business as usual um, and that's what we've got the opportunity to explore next with it which is really exciting but it is it is a challenge you know because um you know for all the reasons that get in the way of everything that's a pilot turning into something um business as usual is is the mindset is it's about money and it's about investment into programs yeah. and it is to a certain extent but it's also around a wider culture change that could take place within the health and care system and within society that would make it normal to to stay active and be active during cancer treatment and before yeah yeah no that's brilliant and um I think Sass Hockey, who actually um, asked that question, said Man Greater Manchester is sounds way ahead. Nothing further up north that I can find in Cumbria, but thanks for the answer. And I think mm -hmm. I, so I've worked with um, one of the CEOs of Active Northumbria, Mark um, Tweedy, mm -hmm. when he used to, you know, we were having conversations around this and I think he's moved his role now, but it takes people like Mark to actually, I know he went and visited the prehab and, and you guys over in Manchester and it takes those people to want to make the change as well and pushing for that new structure and new ideas and how they can take it into their region so I think it's the leaders within those the sector in the different regions that really can help to drive this as well yeah and that's exactly the, the meeting I was in just before this actually was with okay. GM Active and with Health and Care and you know thinking about how does how do we, it was about COVID recovery actually, but you could look at the same thing, isn't it? How do we make sure that people moving more plays its full part in recovery from COVID and beyond? Um, and, and going back to the governance of GM, even that's the strength of it. You've got the health and care system working alongside the leisure trusts, alongside transport and so on. So if anywhere we can join up the conversation, we know we can do it here. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I was just going to add super quick, if you're interested in, in, in looking at any more of that, the, the Q&A we did last week with Heli um, about what they're doing in Norway, check that out if you're interested, because what they're doing there with prehab and rehab is really, really interesting, if you <laughs> want to know a bit more. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you so much for both of your time today. It's been obviously run over, of course, can never keep it to 40 Always. minutes. Always. <laughs> Good chat for hours. I actually just wanted to finish on one um, one comment here. So uh -huh. Katie says, the boys have been listening to Daddy and Jacob is asking when the next 5k away is if he wants another game of ice pie and cake. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. That's so lovely. <laughs> Tell Sarah that's... to make some cake. <laughs> yeah. I bet that's quite nice to hear, Matt, when you're at work as well. So thank yeah, you, absolutely. Katie. Oh, they'll be very proud. But thank you to you both of you for giving us time. Really learned thank a lot. And I think actually um, for us, from our side of the charity, I think I'd love to have some further conversations outside of this live Facebook question and answer as well to pick your guys' brains a little bit more around, around this work. So um, thank you very much to both of you. We are, thank you to everyone who has listened um, and thank you for all your questions. Um, we will go offline now so we could say goodbye to everybody on Facebook. So thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.